theoretical philosophy. Okay, so those of you who raised your hand uh, read something about that. Okay. Okay, I said last time that in his early works, Kant was basically a rationalist. And that meant that he thought that reason alone, pure reason, was able to generate substantive knowledge. For example, knowledge about the existence of God. So substantive knowledge means something like non-trivial knowledge. Uh, something more than just the knowledge that, the example I gave last time, triangles have three angles. Um, substantive knowledge somehow is supposed to amplify or expand or add to the concepts that you're talking about. So the idea that the thought that the knowledge that triangles have three corners, uh, the idea of three corners is already contained, you might say, in the definition of a triangle. So he would later call this contrast, what I'm <clears throat> describing as contrast between trivial and substantive knowledge, as the distinction between analytic claims or analytic knowledge, which you can simply know from an analysis of the concepts involved, um, something like their definition. On the one hand, and synthetic knowledge, uh, where <coughs> genuinely different, independent ideas or concepts are brought together and connected. Okay, so as a rationalist, I say again, he thought that reason alone, maybe the principle of non-contradiction, which says that if there are um, two contradictory claims, they can't both be true together with maybe the principle of sufficient reason, which says that everything has an explanation or cause. We thought that maybe those two principles alone were enough by themselves to generate substantive knowledge. Um, those two principles by themselves are uh, elements of uh, reason, so pure reason, generates a priori, synthetic knowledge, substantive knowledge. That's the rationalist position. Okay, and in particular, he thought that reason alone, pure reason, was able, a priori, of course, to generate substantive knowledge of what I'll call deep metaphysical truths. So this is the kind of thing that rationalists hold that pure reason, reason alone, is able to generate deep metaphysical truth. Basically, more or less, nobody thinks that reason alone is able to determine um, what you're likely to have for dinner tonight or who's going to win the baseball game tomorrow. But reason alone, rationalists think, can generate substantive knowledge of deep metaphysical facts, like, for example, the existence of God. So that was the example that uh, I mentioned last time. Or the existence of an immaterial soul. Or the nature of causality. Okay, but by the probably mid-1760s, um, he began to turn away from this rationalism. And later, in the Prolegomena, um, he wrote that reading Hume, David Hume, awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers. Very famous quote that reads, awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers. And what he meant was his rationalism. Um, so Hume shook it, reading Hume, reading Hume's, um, uh, I think it was the Inquirer probably, uh, shook his faith that reason alone was able to provide deep insights into metaphysical truths that lie beyond the world of ordinary empirical experience, that lie behind it, God's existence, the nature of causality, the material soul. Specifically, he 
he began to doubt, Kant began to doubt, whether reason alone could establish causal relations. Um, but on the other hand, uh, Paul he recognized that causal relations are a kind of necessary relation. That is, there's a kind of necessity when we say that one thing caused another. That is, the other thing had to happen in some sense, given the cause. Um, but he agreed that necessary relations were never found in experience. So there's a problem here about how we can establish causal relations if not by pure reason alone, and if not empirically. Uh, as Kant interpreted him, Hume concluded that causal relations were unreal, were fantasies of the mind, were, um, were not something we could have scientific knowledge of. And this was something Kant could never accept. But he didn't see a way out at the time, rejecting both empiricism and rationalism. Okay. In, in 1770, he published, um, he published what's come to be known as his inaugural dissertation. And this was um, basically outlining some of the elements that um, eventually matured into his so-called transcendental idealism in the, in the critical. So this was called the inaugural dissertation because it was delivered on the occasion of his receiving a chair, an academic chair in metaphysics, at long last at the age of 46. So now he didn't have to pass the hat at um, lectures. He would have a salary. Um, he, as I said, he continued to lecture. But now he was sort of established at University and deans cringe and junior faculty laugh when uh, they recall what happened next because for the next 10 years he basically didn't publish anything at all. So his publications basically stopped and he got this um, endowed chair. And so the 1770s are sometimes known as his silent decade. But uh, the silent decade ended with an absolute explosion. In 1781, at the age of 57, he published The Critique of Pure Reason. Um, and this started an absolutely astonishing period of productivity. So any one of the publications I'm about to mention would have made Kant a major enlightenment thinker. Together, they make him the absolute center of the Enlightenment. So what he published, among many other things, I'm just going to get some highlights here, um, within that decade include uh, what I just mentioned, the prolegomena to any future metaphysics, which were the sort of a summary of some of the ideas of the first critique of reason. The groundwork to the metaphysics of morals, which we're going to be talking about, the metaphysical foundation of natural science a year later, a major revision to the critique of pure reason that's now referred to typically as the B edition, the critique of practical reason the next year, the critique of judgment two years after that. And the productivity, his productivity continued right through the 1790s. I'll just mention a few of these pieces. Um, in 1793, um, a book called Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, which has an important bearing on his ethical theory. Um, and then uh, two books combined as The Metaphysics of Morals in 1797. And this was what? Something that the groundwork to the Metaphysics of Morals was a groundwork to. Uh, so this is a more extensive elaboration of what we'll be uh, looking at in the groundwork, and we'll be reading some parts of this. In 1798, he published an uh, his Anthropology, and along the way, he published a number of important um, political essays. Uh, 
Uh, the religion got him in trouble with political authorities who eventually issued a letter signed personally by the new king, uh, Frederick Wilhelm II, for having, quote, misused his philosophy over a period of time. And this was a serious enough threat to Kant that some of his friends planned for his escape and asylum. Uh, Kant eventually wrote a famous letter in reply to this, in which he first defended himself and then promised that he would not write on religion again. The last thing that he published during his lifetime um, was a series of essays called The Strife, or sometimes it's translated, The Conflict of the Faculties. And faculties here are academic faculties, like areas of the university, in which he um, investigated the relationship between religion, philosophy, and law. And what's really significant here is he gave a very vigorous defense of freedom of speech. Strife or conflict of the faculties, like the faculty of law. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about the metaphysics um, in the critique of pure reason. Um, this will be an important background for what's going on. And let me start by mentioning to you the difference between theoretical reason and practical reason. So the difference between theoretical reason and practical reason is not supposed to be that one is abstract and theoretical, and the other is concrete and applied or something. Rather, it's the difference between, roughly, reasons to believe something about the way the world is, uh, reasons to believe something about how things are or were or will be, and reasons, so that's the reason, and reasons to do something, reasons to do one thing to bring about some end or some change to the world. So if we think that, in general, a reason is maybe a consideration in favor of something, well, if it's in support of some action, if it's a consideration that supports doing something, it's a practical reason. If it's a consideration in support of the truth of some belief or some claim, for example, it's a theoretical reason. Okay. So reasons can be reasons to believe something or reasons to do something. That's the difference between theoretical and practical reason. Now this is a little imprecise since you might ask, what about a reason to believe that you should do something? Is that a reason to believe something or a reason to do something? So in, in, in our sense, that's a practical reason. It's a reason to believe that you should do something. So even though belief is involved there, fundamentally it's about action. So uh, this, as I say, is a little imprecise, but good enough to get you the, the idea. OK, so the critique of pure reason is a, right, a critique of pure reason. So pure reason here is supposed to be a priori the rationalist thing, what reason alone can do. And a critique of that has really two elements. On the one hand, it's critiquing that capacity, that faculty of reason, and so establishing its limits establishing what reason can't do. That's why it's a critique. But it's also, importantly, a defense of reason, a defense of pure reason, within those limits. So crucially, a critique of pure reason is supposed to both establish limits of pure reason and justify the use of pure reason within those limits. 